catch up, but thank you everyone for joining us for another Ask an Expert, what is now becoming quite a series, um, <laughs> speaking with people in our profession um, around issues of sustainability. So um, we are, like the uh, title of the event suggests, we really encourage you to ask your questions. So um, as Kelly and Kate and I are talking, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A and we're going to try to sort of sprinkle in any questions. So don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Um, we're going to try to sort of really engage the audience with this one because um, yeah, I'm imagining everybody's gonna have lots of lots of good questions. So just um, to quickly say, I'm Roxy Sperber. I am the chair of the uh, AIC Sustainability Committee this year. Uh, this is Kate Fugit, who is also on the AIC Sustainability Committee, our networking officer. And today we are speaking with Kelly Krish, who is a preventative conservation specialist at the Image Permanent Institute in Rochester, New York. So um, she, in her role, she provides information and guidance on preventative conservation, um, particularly best practices surrounding sustainable environmental management through outreach and consulting projects and um, at cultural institutions and many other places. Um, so she does it all basically uh, and has a lot of great concrete science to back up some of the stuff that I like to talk a lot about um, and love to see science behind. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kelly just to sort of introduce herself a little bit more uh, thoroughly. Um, and then we're gonna jump into questions. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Roxy. Um, I really appreciate um, kind of the understanding the background and the science to, to what we're doing. And so I'm very happy to, to be at the Image Permanence Institute. We are a nonprofit research lab based out of a university. Um, and we just celebrated uh, 35 years. And so um, it's been great. We had, we, the idea is that um, we um, do a lot of laboratory work, a lot of experiments, and then we take what we learn and we take it to the field and try to apply it in real life scenarios. And then the issues and challenges that we learn about through the field work um, then goes on to inform the future research. So um, in that way, we, we hope to be contributing really valuable resources to the field and learning a lot in the process. So um, IPI started with its background in film and photographic preservation and realizing kind of the importance of environmental parameters in preventing their degradation kind of have expanded into um, more broad environmental studies as well as other forms of uh, damage that can be prevented through preventive conservation. So um, I've been here about six years. I'm trained as an objects and preventive conservator. Uh, and I work closely with my colleague, Christopher Cameron, who's a facilities manager trained in HVAC. Um, so between the two of us, we've, um, well, actually together, the two of us have worked on uh, directly on projects at 60 institutions at least, and then um, you know, interacted with many more through smaller projects or education and outreach expertise. So um, it's, been, it's been really great to connect with people in the field and um, you know, see how each person's situation kind of plays out and what we can do to help improve preservation and sustainability. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Um, 60 plus, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was right. You really have done it all. So <laughs> I don't know about all. It's it, every. It really is like each time you go in, there's you know there's all there's some similarities, but um, yeah, there's always there's always something that keeps it interesting, and uh, you know you you get to really engage with. So um, yeah. So I guess that kind of that kind of segues in. One of the questions we just wanted to start off with for fun was, you know, what really makes you tick about this work? What is super exciting? I know sort of. Um, stereotypically, conservators can sometimes be more, you know, treatment oriented and not um, get the preserve or like the sort of more um, preventative conservation bug. So I'm always interested, you know, what really excites you about this work? Um, well, a number of things. I will say uh, my, my undergraduate's actually in historic preservation. And so I kind of came into the field from from that background rather than from a fine arts background. So in terms of um, an appreciate, you know, appreciating the building envelope and, and the role that that can play, um, that had already been ingrained in me for, for four years prior, but um, there's a, I think preventive has a, a lot going for it. I mean, for one thing, like you may not always have 18th century paintings in your collection, but um, there's gonna be a temperature no matter what. And um, you, you may not, 
be interested in it, or there may not be much you can do to change it, but it's going to be there. And so understanding how it can impact the collections and all the subsequent decisions um, is just really important. And I think it also has so much overlap with sustainability, which is such a pressing, pressing issue for for everyone really to address and do their part. So, um, you know, it's really the most effective way that we can manage collections, prevent future damage, and, you know, reduce our carbon footprint. So um, I've always, I, I enjoy the fact that you can kind of get involved in all aspects, um, you know, that, that preventive really kind of covers lots of different collection types, lots of different situations. There's, there's many aspects to it. There's chemistry, there's physics, there's biology. Um, so you can kind of, um, you know, go, go anywhere with it, but it also, you know, you can relate it to that sustainability aspect, which is so important. Um, well, that's another really great segue. You kind of touched on this already, but one of our first questions was just sort of how you see this work. Um, you know, I think, we often say, and I, I would like to check with you that this is right, that this is one of the areas in which we can be the most impactful as a field. Um, I know museums you have a huge carbon footprint uh, often and other cultural institutions do too. So I'm just curious um, if you could talk a little bit more about how sustainability segues with the work that you do and how combating the climate crisis uh, is sort of integral to this work. Sure, yeah, um, museums are huge consumers of energy. Um, I think there was, uh, a study done that found that um, were comparable or maybe even slightly more than hospitals, um, which if you think about all the things that they have to do, um, it, that's that's not great for our field. Um, and I'll say too, for anybody who might be interested, um, the EPA's portfolio manager is actually a great place where you can upload your energy bills and get an understanding of how you compare to buildings of similar size and age and really get a sense of your own benchmark. Um, but yes, we are very big users of energy um, and HVAC and lighting make up a very significant portion of it. So I don't know if it's like the biggest way we can impact um, sustainability, but it's definitely a, a major contributor. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as places that where we want to be leaders and seen as, um, you know, examples to the public and everything. I think, you know, demonstrating best practices ourselves is really important. Um, and when you think about preservation, you know, we're, we're preserving objects that are important to people and we want them to last for a long time. So, um, you know, caring that the environment outside of our museum is also there and the people outside who who want to come and see these these objects are you know um living good lives <laughs> and able to to enjoy their culture uh it just it just makes so much sense that we would we would also want to support those goals um you know in preservation more broadly so um i really like that about our work because we always said as our goal is kind of to optimize preservation and sustainability and there's so many opportunities where we can do both or we can improve one without negative impacts to the other and so you know seeing those those opportunities and and being able to implement them um you know it's it's just a real win from a a preservation standpoint and, and meaning preservation in the broad sense even so. So um, in a lot of your work at IPI, um, you've mentioned to Roxy and I in previous conversations, you have identified uh, six, six HVAC strategies um, that can really help um, you know, cultural institutions reduce their um, energy use. Can you talk briefly about those strategies that you've identified? Sure, and I should say too that um, that I didn't identify them. They're actually, they're energy saving strategies that have um, been used in industries for many years. And so um, IPI has worked with, with others as well, um, including uh, architect Peter Herzog and um, over the years has tested how we can apply these in, in museum settings. And so it's really drawing again on, on a lot of laboratory based work done by many of my colleagues here at IPI, um, as well as as well as what we're seeing in the field. But yeah, there's really six. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll try to be brief about the explanations. Uh, I, 
not everyone loves HVAC as much <laughs> as I do, but uh, it, it's pretty interesting. So, so system shutdowns is probably the most straightforward. So if you think about like, how do I save energy? Um, turn it off is the easiest way. Uh, you're not consuming any then. Um, and so, so system shutdowns, when we turn off our HVAC, what we're really doing is we're depending on the quality of our building envelope to maintain conditions. And so we, we've actually, I would say that this strategy is actually much more successful than I think people would initially, would initially think. So when we, we tested this through um, an IMLS grant and we partnered with institutions in Delaware, Virginia, and Louisiana, and um, they were actually all able to shut the system down, including the institution in Louisiana. Um, it just varies when you can do it and for how long. Um, and so it's a matter of kind of tailoring those strategies in, in ways that make sense. Um, and not, not every system will be able to be shut down. Um, you know, it depends on the programming and like I said, the building envelope and what kind of collections it's housing. Um, so that's a very important um, qualifier I should really put on all of them that not all of them will apply or you know it might be some combination that works best for you but um, system shutdowns again turning the system off and relying on the building envelope for a certain period of time to help um, a lot of times these are overnight where we don't have occupancy we tend to have lower heat loads on the space but sometimes they're in the middle of the day when energy costs are the highest uh, so a variation on that is really a system setback. And so that tends to be more on, um, you're still running the HVAC system, but you're not trying to control it as tightly. So this is really useful for things like exhibit spaces and that sort of thing where, um, you know, maybe during those winter months, you need to run it to maintain human comfort conditions. But at night, it's not as critical to maybe maintain 70 degrees, and maybe you can back it off to 65. Um, and those lower temperatures are going to help increase the relative humidity. Um, and so you're not doing as much work with humidification either. So you can kind of play with some of the, those strategies on um, more, more of a on a daily basis there. Then there's fan speed reduction. And so this is maybe like the most complicated of all of them. But essentially, the way it works is that um, when you slow a fan down and you reduce the horsepower, the energy it's consuming, it's not a direct relationship with the amount of airflow you get. Um, it's actually a cubic relationship and it's related through what's called the fan affinity law. And so, um, so actually what happens is you could, um, you know, turn your fan down to consume say 13% of the original energy. So an 87% reduction in horsepower and you'd still get 50% of the airflow. So, um, so there's a major advantage there. You can still be delivering air to the space, um, but at much lower energies. Um, there's some other things you can do with fans too. Sometimes there's um, fan banks where instead of one big fan, people have kind of a set of you know, nine smaller fans that go across and you don't have to have them all operating at the same time. And you can kind of apply that fan affinity law to each one and really see even more savings. But um, not all fans, again, not all fans can have their speed reduced, but um, many of them can. And that can be a, a big energy savings because of that relationship. Another one is the outside air reduction. And so often we bring in outside air to spaces. We use it to kind of ventilate. Uh, I think we think of outside air as fresh, you know, whether it is or, or not. Um, and, and just to kind of, uh, you know, clear out those indoor generated pollutants and, uh, you know, the, the CO2 and everything that we're emitting, bring in, bring in outside air. We also have to bring in outside air to maintain a positive pressurization in our spaces. There's always leaks in building envelopes. Um, you know, there's doors, there's windows, there's, there's going to be leaks. And so we have to be introducing air into our spaces in order to make sure that um, we're keeping a positive pressure and not drawing in unwanted air. But outside air, uh, depending on the outdoor climate and what your goals are, we often have to do a lot of work, a lot of heating, cooling, dehumidification, or humidification in order to get to those goals. Um, so, so the more we can rely on return air that's often much closer to the conditions we want for the space and reduce that outside air, the less work the system has to do to be able to meet those set points. Um, Again, there's there's all there are there are qualifiers. We, we like I said, we do need outside air, and the amount um, if it's an occupied space is often determined by codes. So this is much more of a strategy for storage spaces where we don't have the occupancy concerns. 
um, seasonal set points is really kind of the final of the, the pure HVAC strategy. And that just has to do with, um, you know, making sure that we're kind of matching our goals more closely with what's happening in our outside environment it creates less work for the mechanical system and it can also help us with um, some of our preservation goals so you wouldn't want to do this or any of the strategies really to the detriment of the collection but often we do see that many collection types can accept a broader range of relative humidity and benefit from lower temperatures so with seasonal set points we might use those lower temperatures in winter um, and you know we might have slightly higher relative humidity in summer than we do in winter uh, and it just helps when when the system has less to do it can often provide a it can meet those goals and provide the conditions we need for those um, and then the final one is uh, a little bit of a a little bit of an outsider, but we often stress um, light reduction. And so, um, you know, using fewer lights, using better lights, turning the lights off can, can be a really effective strategy. One of the things we usually say is that you pay for lights twice, because um, not only are you paying for the light, but you're also paying for the heat that the lights add to the space that you then have to remove. Um, and we can often see in environmental data and someone came in, they turn the lights on, and you know, the pattern just repeats every day. You'll see it, you know, a couple of one, two degree temperature gain every day from, from those lights. So those are kind of the six strategies. Hopefully that wasn't too long, but I'll say to you, um, yeah, for anyone who's interested, uh, the we have a methodology book that I think was provided in the, the links either with this talk or um, we can drop it in the chat too, but it's free for download. It outlines all the strategies, talks about like what might make you a good candidate for this, how you would go about testing it and the criteria for seeing if it was effective or you might want to modify it. So, because um, again, we always want to make sure that we're we're doing right by the collection for it. I think this is so important to kind of ground our conversation in those. I know it was a lot for you to go through. So thank you. Sorry, I feel like you talked a lot there. <laughs> no, no, no. It's perfect because it really, it's not something that I really learned in school. It's not, I, I mean, we hear about all of these different things, maybe piecemeal, but I like, I like that you kind of put it out, like here are the six options, you know? Um, and so I will definitely be downloading that book. I can promise you that. Um, we did get a question from the audience that I want to ask. Um, so Jay Brown, thank you for your question, uh, asks what percentage reduction in energy use lighting slash HVAC is feasible in museums? So this might, I would assume this is sort of dependent on how much you start with. Um, like if you've started with three out of the six already, then maybe you're, you're going to be able to reduce less, but I don't know how you would handle that. And if you have any more uh, qualifiers, um, questioner, you can <laughs> throw those in the chat too. Yeah, sure. Well, it definitely depends on a number of factors. Um, and we kind of look at it as those like levels of control. So first of all, the type of outside environment you have, you know, for those of um, for those who might be living in climates that are a little more compatible with what we would typically see as set points for museums, obviously, you're going to be doing less work to meet those goals, whereas um, you know, people who are in more aggressive climates where there's a lot of cooling or a lot of dehumidification needed um, some that that's it's probably going to consume more energy but the next factor is really your building envelope and how that's um, designed how it's maintained um, I think it's often a pretty overlooked component uh, just how important it is not only to have proper insulation but a vapor barrier um, and air blocks so that we we understand it. If you're in a historic structure, it's even more complicated because uh, they were designed to function in a certain way. Um, and it's not necessarily totally sealed up. Sometimes when we start blocking things off, we mess with the airflow um, in unexpected ways. So, so building envelope is definitely the next factor. Um, we, we'd also be looking at the type of mechanical system you have, um, depending on its age, the design, uh, the layout, those can those can be major factors. So um, one of the things we often see in terms of strategies is what might be one HVAC system. And this always seems to happen where it'll serve a collection space. And it seems like a great opportunity based on the collection needs and everything where we can, you know, try some of these strategies, we can reduce the temperature, it'll be great for the collection. Um, and then, you know, when you look at the ductwork layout, it also serves it almost always serves the director's office. Um, I don't know why they do that, but, <laughs> but um, you know, probably the, you know, the person in, in the museum who's not going to want to have their office be set to 60 degrees um, 
you know, and understandably so, uh, you know, that when you have those mixed use, um, it really, you know, kind of limits your options. And um, since you're trying to meet different goals, then anytime you're doing that, uh, it's going to try to involve more energy or some kind of compromise. So, so the, the HVAC system itself, and then even the type of storage furniture um, can play a real uh, major role in it. And the layout of that, how, how um, you know, how dense it is, or, you know, the types of of um, enclosures that are used can do a can play a major role in terms of helping to control the environment or making the space more responsive to to changes in the HVAC. So there's a ton of variation, um, but I would say that uh, if I can, like, I'll just make a general statement that it's probably more than you think. Um, <laughs> that that it can be quite a bit. If you think of like a system shutdown. Um, if you see a shutdown for eight hours out of the day, um, you know, out of a 24 hour day, that's a third of the time that you're not consuming energy for that HVAC system. So some of the strategies can really be quite effective. Um, we've worked with other institutions where because of the lighting, we, you know, depending on how far they took it, you know, if they just were turning them off or if they changed the lighting system or they had them on timers, uh, you know, we, we were finding, um, one library had close to like sixty thousand dollars in energy savings for the year, so it can it can be quite significant. Thank you, Kelly. We are getting a lot more questions, which is really wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask Vincent's question now. Can you comment on the effectiveness of passive slash non mechanical climate control strategies for museum environmental management? I would love to. Um, thank you for that question. I think, um, yeah, even though like the bulk of my job is looking at HVAC systems, I I think passive measures um, and, and microclimates really should be where we start um, because we should do what we can non-mechanically before we start looking at the mechanical system. Um, sometimes we're able to achieve the goals without the HVAC, um, or at least we're able to reduce the amount of work that we need to do with the HVAC system. And so I would highly recommend um, for people who are looking you know, at microclimates, when you have your monitoring, your environmental monitoring systems in place, you know, certainly have a room monitor, but also have one that's where the collections are. So if they're in certain types of boxes or they're all within cabinets, put a monitor in there and really get a sense of um, how well do they buffer against changes. Um, it tends to be less effective for temperature changes. Um, and, and usually you'll still see the, those fluctuations occur, but um, relative humidity, which is often one of our biggest concerns really, um, it, it, it can do a great job. So I've seen examples in exhibit spaces as well as storage spaces. Um, one institution we're working with, um, it, they actually had materials within a cabinet and then a, a monitor outside. And um, you know, it's it's in the mid-Atlantic over the summer. So the relative humidity is high, it's fluctuating all over the place. And inside the cabinet, though, where the collections actually were, they they saw like a two percent gain in relative humidity over the course of two weeks. Um, so that's amazing. Um, you know, and then then like that whole conversation about like, do we you know, how do we do humidify in a historic building envelope or something like that? It's it's much less of an issue because we know that our collections, the collections that is what we care about and that they're not experiencing such extreme conditions. So, um, so, so microclimates can definitely be effective in that. I've seen the same thing with exhibit cases. They can be really effective even without Zorbins, um, that they can do a great job of buffering. And uh, I would just kind of related to that with passive storage environments, we do a lot of work with um, new construction and, and that sort of thing. And, and people are concerned and rightly so about what kind of HVAC they get. Um, but that building envelope is so critical. So anything you can do to make sure that that space is able to maintain the kind of conditions you want, um, it's really important. HVAC systems, you know, they may not be replaced for 30, 50 or more years, which is a really long time. So that decision is important, but building envelopes are even longer. So the better we can do in terms of, um, in terms of our passive measures, it, it's great for preservation and it's great for sustainability. Uh, and I'll just say one more thing on the topic before, before I uh, let that, let that rest. But, um, 
It's also really important in terms of emergency situations. Uh, mechanical systems fail um, and they tend to fail like over the July 4th weekend, you know, where it's like worst case scenario, it's hot, it's humid and nobody's there. Um, so, so, or, you know, even, um, you know, not, not in that scenario, but it might take, you know, sometimes things break and it might take a month to replace something. So if you have a good, um, or power outages, if you have a good building envelope that you know you can rely on and it's gonna buy you that extra time, still maintaining good preservation conditions, um, it can be really effective for sustainability and making sure the collections stay safe, regardless of um, kind of what else might be going on. Well, funny you should mention it because we have a question from Ellen here about uh, just that very scenario. Um, she writes, is there a difference between system shutdowns and system failures? We recently had our steam pump knocked out causing a big drop in RH in a short amount of time. Does this give us information about our building envelope? Um, or sorry, does that give us information if our building envelope is feasible for system shutdowns? It may. Um, we do actually really like to look at data from power outages or other types of issues um, when, when we're kind of looking at, at the strategies. So it can be very effective. Some of it, though, depends on what other types of operations were going on. So for example, um, not, not knowing more about the situation, let's say say there was an issue and so people were going in and out of the space to try to, you know, to fix the issue. Uh, so that door's opening, people are coming in and out or maybe it's remaining open. You might be seeing that increase in relative humidity, not because you have a bad room envelope, but because, because the door was open. Um, and I've seen other scenarios where, you know, the, the system, is turned off or something, but maybe not all of the components shut down. So, you know, a reheat might have stayed on and the temperature increased really quickly. Um, not, not the situation for, for Ellen, but, um, you know, th those kind of things can kind of make the data seem like it might not be an option. Um, but, but definitely the, the power outage or any kind of system failure is a really good opportunity to learn one about the operation of the mechanical system and, and two about the building envelope. So Kim has asked, asked a question, um, and I realize that this might be complicated and very dependent on, um, you know, where different cultural institutions are located throughout the US or even in other countries. Um, but she asks, are you aware of published case studies regarding upgrades to HVAC or related systems that include dollar amounts of energy savings? That kind of information might be persuasive to my institution in a way that other arguments have not been. And I think that question really hits upon um, something that a lot of us are concerned about is how we get, you know, institutional buy-in. And unfortunately, in a lot of instances, you know, people want to see some numbers, um, you know, connected to that. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, there have been some case studies, I would say they are limited. And again, like, like you were saying, Kate, it can be difficult to see like how directly it would apply just because um, even the pricing for mechanical systems varies wildly across the country, depending on where you are. And even where your HVAC is located in terms of the building, um, you know, trying to replace something on top of a five-story, you know, on a rooftop of a five-story building where you might need a crane and to shut down a city street is, you know, is very different than, um, you know, if it's on the first floor in a more suburban area. Um, so, so prices can vary quite a bit. But one thing that I, I can say, it's, it's not necessarily like a direct case study, but often um, when we work with architects or mechanical engineers, they can, they can model kind of the, the different options and what kind of costs would be associated with each one. Um, so they would be able to provide, it comes at a cost, but they would be able to provide you with a more direct answer that's relevant to to your specific scenario. So I would encourage you to, um, to talk with any, any of the firms that you might be working with for those kind of projects and just ask if they have that kind of data or, um, or would be able to get it. Um, so one thing that we wanted to address, and thanks to the audience for all these questions, keep them coming. Um, but one thing we wanted to address kind of before we got too far uh, is this sort of um, assumption that perhaps making changes to our environmental controls uh, in terms of making them less rigid 
um, will negatively impact uh, the condition of objects. And so I just wanted to ask you if you could discuss, you know, sort of some of the work that you've done um, where more sustainable practices have actually potentially served to even preserve them better, if that's the, if that's the case, or, or, you know, kind of had not had an effect. So I was curious if you could kind of address that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, there's, um, there's actually quite a few instances. So um, I guess one of the ones to kind of start off with from a from a temperature set point, we'll say is uh, so. So we know that a lot of our organic materials, you know, they they have um, their chemical decay is accelerated at higher temperatures. Uh, you know, reactions occur faster at higher temperatures, and so we often advocate for for lower temperatures. Um, so you know, for that reason. So if you have um, if you don't have occupancy in your storage space, so you're not trying to to heat to certain set points. Or it's winter time and you're able to use those lower temperature set points. Um, again, that means you're not reheating air. And when you don't reheat it, you're not drying it out as much. So you're also not humidifying it and you're slowing the rates of chemical decay. So kind of using those seasonal set points or um, you know, the lower temperatures can be a real benefit um, for both. Some of the other examples kind of related to temperature would have to do more with, um, for example, blocking windows um, or not having windows in the first place. Uh, you know, so we don't have that solar load coming in. So uh, we also don't have the temperature gains that it's offering. We don't have to remove it through the mechanical system and we don't have the decay that can be caused by light. Um, seen a lot of um, other issues with temperature where things might be turned on or turned on more than than people might be aware of, you know, especially radiators or things that might not be, you know, directly controlled or might be done manually rather than electronically. Sometimes those get left on and so they're just dumping a ton of heat into a space and we really don't don't want that. Um, other examples would be, you know, in terms of maybe relative humidity, um, depending on your collection type, and I, I definitely agree with that caveat, um, sometimes we can accept, again, seasonal set points or looser set points. For a lot of our collections, you know, 30 to, to 50 or 55 really percent relative humidity, we're, we're generally within a safe range, you know, we're, uh, and that's again, very dependent, not only on collection type, but the history of the collection, where we are in the world. Um, but just speaking generally, we tend to be at a lower risk for mold germination, uh, from, for metal corrosion, preventing mechanical damage within that range. There's been many studies done uh, for different material types, uh, look that kind of show that specific range is, uh, the, the lower risk for mechanical damage. So, so if we kind of use those seasonal set points, again, we're working with that outdoor environment. So we're doing, we're performing less work, um, but we're also able to kind of uh, meet our preservation goals. Outside air can also sometimes be one when we reduce the outside air, the mechanical system's better able to keep up. Um, it doesn't, you know, we might be overwhelming it and it may not be able to dehumidify and meet those set points um, in summer. So by reducing the outside air and it doesn't have as much work to do, um, it might be able to provide that 55% relative humidity, whereas before it was struggling to maybe get down to 70. Um, so, so that can sometimes be an option. And then in terms of things that don't necessarily increase the preservation benefit, but don't hurt, I would say there are many um, inefficiencies in mechanical operation that are not self-announcing. And you don't know unless you have the monitoring system in place. So um, we've been in many, many places where there will be two supply diffusers and one's putting out 50 degree air and one's putting out 90 degree air so that they can make a 70 degree environment. And so what, what you're seeing is that it's 70 degrees, but it's done with 40 degrees more worth of work than that actually had to be done. Uh, and that, and that's pretty significant. Uh, and there's other examples too. Sometimes, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see operations that don't make sense where, you know, the, the system will work really hard to dry out the air and then the humidity is added back in downstream. And um, so, you know, really looking at each stage where work is done um, to the air, you can, you can identify some of those inefficiencies and they can, they can be quite um, significant. 
So building on this question a little bit, um, and I think you gave a ton of great examples there. So if there aren't any more to give, then we, we can move on to another question. Um, but I feel like, you know, we are often operating sort of under these, these myths about changing the way that we look at the environmental data in cultural heritage institutions. And so I'm just wondering if there are any other, um, you know, examples that you can think of where we have the evidence, we know that there are alternatives and we're still not doing it. I feel like our field is kind of slow to change in that respect. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, um, <laughs> I, I tend to agree with that, Kate. <laughs> I mean, I think even uh, just to take like a really straightforward example of lighting, um, you know, I think we know that that light can cause damage, um, but and we know it costs energy to run. Um, that's probably one where institutions are moving in terms of like switching to LEDs and such. But sometimes what happens with that is when when we see it as less of a risk, we don't address it as much. So I've seen places, you know, switch to LEDs and then they leave the lights on all the time because there's not that same same risk. And so, so it's still not really like, if you're leaving them on all the time, that that's still not the preservation and sustainability gain that it could have been. Um, and I, I think it's difficult to kind of, it is hard to change mentalities. It's hard to change ingrained practices, um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, light switches aren't located in, in good places in order to be able to do that. But, but, you know, we do know that that's there. And if there are opportunities, we can take advantage of it. I think from an environmental standpoint, we do have a lot of, um, a lot of really great laboratory research, a lot of really good examples from the field that do advocate for, um, more sustainable environmental management, but I think there's still this, this sense of, um, you know, having, having a straight line is best and trying to maintain that. Uh, and, and some of that even goes to, you know, in terms of exhibit spaces, what our loan practices are um, and what we want to see. So, so it's slow moving. I, I think, I think we're getting there though. Um, and, and definitely the more people who can publish and share those examples, the better those, those tend to be the most effective means. So, um, yeah, it's, it's coming along. I'll say I was excited to see that, um, the key futures program has a place where they can share case studies and, um, and everything. So I, I think there, there's definitely an interest in doing so, and I hope to see more of it. That is really hopeful. It does seem like this stuff is all about sort of individual granular, you know, figuring out as we go, which is a great problem for us because that's really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> I think we like to, you know, it's it's always nerve wracking too if you feel like you're the only one doing it. So having a sense that there's other institutions out there who are interested, who are doing the same thing and going through the same struggles, um, the same struggles as everybody else, like that can that can be a good a good shared experience to work through. Absolutely. Um, so if anyone does have any experience with this and wants to share it to our Gmail, please do. Um, we would love to like circulate that more widely. Um, okay, but let me just ask another question. <laughs> um, so for those of us who work in institutions, I think it'd be really great to kind of talk a little bit about how we move this into, into practice. Um, and so one of the things that I think a lot of us wonder about is sort of who we should be collaborating with within our institutions to make this practice greener, you know, where do we get the data from, um, you know, who do we talk to to implement these strategies, obviously it's going to be a really complex story, but uh, I'm just curious if you have sort of um, experience with creating teams that can kind of affect this change more um, powerfully. Yeah, it's um, it can be a tricky balance because it's definitely you want to make sure that you have buy in and all the, the stakeholders are there, but you also maybe don't want to have every meeting be everybody at your institution. So it can, it can be kind of a tricky place to um, place to start. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of staff turnover in different positions. And um, so making sure that 
the the um, advances that you make you know stay there and, and it's really actually ingrained in practices rather than a single individual advocating for it can be is really important um probably i mean it won't come as a surprise probably from considering what like the kind of work i do but i would say you know starting with um facilities is a really great point because depending on what the mechanical system is capable of doing uh, that's going to determine everything it, not just in meeting your preservation goals but your sustainability ones as well and so having a good relationship with them and understanding um you know what their challenges are and and everything can be really important i've seen i've seen a lot of frustrated relationships between facilities and collections and it has a lot to do with you know sometimes collections people will be asking for conditions that the mechanical systems can't provide um and so they're in a position where they're like trying to meet it and they don't and it it gets really frustrating and i've even seen instances where like from a physics standpoint it was not possible like the the dew point of the mechanical system could not possibly create the combination of temperature and rh that they wanted um and so so it was like there was nothing that these poor facilities people could do to meet that goal. And they also have a lot of other challenges too, in terms of other demands on their time, or they might, um, they might be trying to give you the conditions and then somebody else comes along and says, this is kind of cold, can you turn the temperature up? And, you know, it's unclear, you know, there's no policy in place for what it's, you know, what it's going to take to change those temperatures. So they respond and, and they get kind of stuck in the middle. So, so starting with facilities and making sure that um, that you kind of understand the position they're in and the, and what the capabilities and challenges would be for them can be a really great place. Um, From there, certainly some, some institutions do already have sustainability officers or um, departments universities usually have some kind of green initiatives going on and involving them can be really great because the inst institution's kind of already committed to that. Um, so bringing them on board and showing what your intentions are can be really effective. Certainly administration um, is going to, to want to know what's going on, uh, especially if there's any kind of financial costs associated with it. So um, yeah, it kind of builds from there. And then once you start talking about specific spaces, that often involves curators or maybe even um, people more public facing who might be, you know, having to explain like why things are in are behind vitrines or, <laughs> you know, like why, you know, maybe some institutions, people, you know, they feel they want to wear their coat, coat or something or it feels a little warm to them in the summer and explaining why that might be. Um, so, so it kind of snowballs from there, but you kind of can make your allies and, uh, you know, start, start small and, and it'll grow. Um, and, and I think more often than not, we've seen, we've seen people kind of come on board more easily than, than what, what it might seem like initially. And I will say too, that having funding and, um, time to make to make the changes can make a big difference too so um you know go after the those grants and and opportunities so that the money's there and and that's at least one question that the institution can can see being addressed we have um a really great question by an anonymous attendee um, who would like to know a little bit more about loan requirements. And they write, my institution spends so much time and energy on keeping lenders happy by maintaining the tight requirements in special exhibition spaces while feeling that our collection can handle more relaxed conditions. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about how loan requirements can be changed to be a little bit more sustainable, maybe use less energy. Yeah, I would say, um anonymous attendee is not alone. That's definitely been an issue. Um, and I think it seems like from the surveys and everything that most institutions are kind of in, the, they kind of agree, but also don't change their loan policies. Uh, and, and we see that a lot of policies are, you know, more strict than what institution, what they're loaning out, they require stricter standards than what they're maintaining when the object's in place. So, it's difficult. There's a lot of politics at play. Um, we recently, uh, my, myself and um, uh, Joyce Lee at the, uh, through the American Association of Museums published a, 
a blog post that was looking at microclimates for exhibit spaces, and they were able to kind of quantify the financial savings and the energy savings associated with some of those. So if it's possible, you know, using those microclimates or loan objects to you know meet their goals um, and then managing your spaces the way that is most appropriate for your collections can be quite cost effective. Um, and again, you know, maybe just through the cases or cases with sorbents or um, one of the institutions that we talked about in the blog post was even um, they have they had a very small dedicated um, HVAC unit, but it was really just for for humidity purposes. And they were able to to meet the needs of the of that particular object without trying to condition the space as a whole that way. So, um, I would say that I think there's change coming in that regard, and it's really good to hear that somebody, um, you know, somebody else is is also like saying, you know, this is an issue and wants to address it. Yeah, it feels like sustainability needs to be built into like our central um, loans, you know, just like the, the centrality of loan agreements in so many ways uh, that it's not. So that's yeah. really a conversation. That's <laughs> it's, it's a tough topic because it does involve so many parties and, um, you know, especially you're, if you're crossing climate zones and have fragile objects and, mm -hmm. and, and all of the, the um, insurance complications. So, so definitely, I'm afraid I can't comment too much in terms of loan, loan policies. Uh, so, but I can say that from, from what I've seen in the field, it's definitely a topic of interest and one that people are trying to address. So I hope we will see change in the future and um, yeah, loan requirements that match the needs of the object and allow us to operate more sustainably while meeting those goals. Well, along those lines, um, we our next question was, um, how do you see our approach to environmental uh, energy saving strategies changing in the next 10 years uh, or even beyond? Obviously, we're sort of at the precipice of a major global crisis and we all need to be doing what we can. Um, but do you have any ideas? Obviously, we're asking you to hypothesize. But <laughs> what would you love to see happen in the next 10 years? Yeah, um, it's tough to say. I would say, you, you know, it's it's been interesting too, even with COVID, because um, a lot of times institutions will do these studies, they, they find these opportunities, and then implementation and staying with it are, are challenges because of the staff turnover and, and all the other issues. So, um, you know, we, we did see like increased interest in terms of understanding air filtration and airflow and distribution, uh, you know, because of COVID. And we also saw the financial reasons for wanting to be more sustainable kind of come into play. So um, one institution that uh, we spoke with, so they, they, they kind of implemented these energy saving strategies in order to save, save staff jobs. Um, and they were able to, to demonstrate that it was, um, you know, they were maintaining preservation conditions or improving it and able to save enough money that they were, were retaining jobs. And so I think that's really great uh, that, you know, there's, because those people then can go on to do so much for the collection too. Um, and, and, we're, and we still have the good preservation in place. So, so there is, does seem to be becoming more motivations for, um, for implementing the strategies and really looking critically at our operations. Um, I'll say too, well, this is like personally, I'm excited about we're, we're currently doing a research project where we're doing pollutant monitoring for indoor and outdoor generated pollutants in, in collection spaces. And we're using that information to further inform the energy saving strategies. So when we, you know, like I said, when we bring in out, outdoor air, uh, there's there's costs associated with it, but we're also doing it for reason, you know, dilute those internally generated pollutants. So, so we're hoping to kind of get at a place where we can kind of optimize air exchanges and say, you know, we're not bringing in outdoor generated pollutants, but we are removing indoor generated ones and we're doing so with the lowest energy use that we, that we need to do. So I'm 
Um, I think, you know, that'll be great. We're looking more critically at, at those aspects of the operation. Um, more people are questioning even like their filters and, you know, what level of filtration is appropriate? How often do those really need to be changed? Um, and kind of, you said, this critical examination factor and actually having monitoring in place to make informed decisions and um, take that risk-based approach is, is going to be really critical. Um, so we have another audience question, which actually lines up perfectly with um, the question I was going to ask anyway. Um, can you describe IPI's process of consulting with individual institutions about managing their museum environment? Um, so maybe talk a little bit about how, um, you know, how some of the folks in the audience or others um, could get your amazing help with their collections. Um, well, yeah, so, so we, we do work with institutions. Um, it's sometimes those are self-funded. Sometimes people will go through grants and I'll, I'll take the opportunity to kind of plug some of the grant opportunities <laughs> that we, we often see. So the National Endowment for the Humanities has a number of great programs. One is um, Sustaining Cultural Heritage Collections or SCHC. And they have two different branches. One is planning and one is implementation. And it's really great because the implementation funds can actually be used for making, you know, for for an upgrade to a mechanical system or for installing mon, you know, installing a BMS or sorry, um, so that's for controlling the HVAC system. So so you can actually make, you know, physical changes with that funding, which um, not not all grant opportunities allow you to do that. And so those are both both the planning and the implementation are. Um, pretty sizable and, and really excellent opportunities for, for looking at these kind of issues. They also have a preservation assistance grant, which is really designed, um, I believe, more for like smaller mid-sized institutions, but um, can, you can bring in consultants and, and um, there's, usually, there's money for, for implementation or even for purchasing tools. So if you, you know, wanted to start monitoring the space or get an infrared camera so you can look at where those heat loads might be, those sorts of things, um, that can be great. The Frankenthaler um, Climate Initiative offers um, funding as well. And so they can be a really great opportunity. Um, so there's a number of different, different programs. There's state and local funding opportunities as well, depending on where you're located um, or for those who, who would maybe be self-funded instead. But um, yeah, we the the general approach for working with us is um, you can you can reach out um, my my email I can drop it in the chat or provide it through contact and, and we just set up a time to to talk through you know what's going on um, and how we might best be able to assist. Sometimes we do site visits. Sometimes we work remotely with people. Um, we'll help them with with data analysis or you know looking at construction drawings. Um, remotely and, and giving feedback that way, or we can we can come on site and put loggers in your HVAC system and, and look at the data with you and tell you what might be going on and how you might be able to operate more sustainably. So um, we've done projects anywhere from you know a single site visit to you know multiple years, and um, yeah, happy to work with work with whomever, whoever might be interested in looking at that environment and how they might improve the preservation or sustainability. Yeah, that would be awesome if you would put a, any contact info in the chat, um, then folks can, can copy that without having to go anywhere else. <laughs> um, we did have another question from our email that I'm not sure you know how specific you'll be able to get, but I will read it off to you. Um, so from November to March every year, the relative humidity in my institution's library building looks like a roller coaster when plotted on a graph. For example, daily flu uh, average fluctuations from 25% RH to 15 to 40 in the course of a week aren't uncommon. For paper-based collections, is this low humidity and constant fluctuation a problem for long-term preservation? Yes, yeah, so um, I won't go too, too much into the the risk for collections without knowing more about the type of collection and the enclosure. But I would, I would say, um, for my first question would to to this person would probably be um, where are your monitors? So do you have monitors 
like are the are the objects within boxes and there are monitors within the boxes that are reading this or is this based off of a thermostat rather than a, a data logger like um, just just to get a better understanding of um, of where the data is coming from if if, it, if you're seeing it within enclosures even or you know if the, the objects are on open storage and you're seeing those kind of fluctuations within the space um, that might represent a higher risk than if you're seeing it at the thermostat itself um, so sometimes thermostats aren't recalibrated very regularly and um, might be more of an issue of either airflow distribution or sensor calibration than it might be in terms of what the objects are actually experiencing. Um, and my other question would probably be, even before figuring out what the risks are to the collection, maybe understanding even more why the fluctuations are occurring because it might point more to an issue either with the, the building or with the mechanical system that you probably would want to address either way. So, um, cause that is, that it sounds like those are pretty, pretty wide fluctuations to be seeing just within a single day. So, um, so it would be interesting to, and curious to kind of get a better sense of what those causes might be um, before, before kind of addressing whether it would be a risk or not. Sorry, that's probably it's hard to get hard to get people to to put real numbers on it, but it's hard to establish without seeing the data or the the space or anything. So, but those would be my first two tips. That's great, thank you. Uh, so we only have about five more minutes. Um, so I just wanted to open this up to you, Kelly. Is there anything else that you think is super important for us to know that you would want? to share with everyone um, and it's okay if you feel like we have kind of covered all the major bases. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's been pretty thorough. I would say, I, I'm sure I'll think of things like an hour or so after we get off the call that I should have said um, and, and didn't, but I'm, I'm really glad we talked about some of the passive strategies, but also um, the HVAC ones. And I'll just say too that, uh, I agree. I'm not, not sure if it was you, Kate, or Roxy, but um, yeah, it's it's not something I learned in school either. Um, and so, and it takes time to kind of understand how to read the drawings or how the, the operation of the mechanical system can work and how it can influence what you're seeing in the data um, or even data analysis or I'll say even understanding dew point and what exactly that is and how you control it it just, it takes time. So if you're in a place where you kind of feel like it's a little overwhelming or frustrating or, or just not getting it, um, yeah, feel free to reach out because I've definitely been there too. Um, awesome. I'm curious if just kind of along those lines, I was just thinking about a loan agreement that I signed off on a few uh, days ago and I'm and I just sort of arbitrarily put the RH that I always put, you know, and I'm curious, and that, that painting is in a microclimate, it's pretty solid. Um, and so I'm curious though, like on an individual object basis, like how do you go about experimenting and knowing whether or not it could be wider? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, I would say it's, um, it's, it's probably a larger conversation at the institution, you know, talking through, talking with people who have, um, you know, who maybe if, if there's, you know, other conservators who have, who have worked with the object or um, curators who might have uh, an understanding of, of the materials or how it's constructed and, and getting into that. But I, I agree, it is hard in terms of an object level um, criteria. So, you know, we, we generally recommend, you know, kind of starting broad and then narrowing in on those specific objects that have special needs. But once you start getting beyond like, um, you know, this, this is pyrite and so it requires this condition and, and talking about composite objects that might have very different climate histories, um, it, it is a challenge. Um, I've seen, seen materials crack because they went to, um, you know, cold northern climates in the winter, and it was really dry. And I've seen um, northern institutions that had, you know, 10% relative humidity or less, and their objects were totally fine because they've been in it for 30 years. So it's, just, point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to say. And I, um, 
you know, we definitely want to do what's safest for the collections. So, uh, so I understand the the object level application is is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. That's a really important point. Thank you for clarifying that in my head. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say thank you so much again to Kelly. Thank you, Elena, for um, having us, uh, hosting us, AIC, um, and Kate for co-hosting with me. It's always a pleasure to have these guests. Um, I always learn so much and then have like a million questions after too. So <laughs> thank you so much for your generosity with your knowledge. Um, and yeah, thank you to all the folks who came in and asked questions and please do share this. It will be recorded. I know we did have a question about that. So um, we're gonna put it on YouTube and we'll try to um, let everybody know when that happens so that uh, if you wanna share it with other colleagues and try to you know, um, get this knowledge out there, then you can do that. So uh, thanks everyone for attending and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, those were great questions and thank you all for, um, for having me. Cool. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, everyone.